Anyway, in 1839, rather reluctantly, he handed over the reins to young John Hughes, and there was no great love loss between the two of them. But in the next five years, Hughes became a nationally known figure. I should mention one last thing about poor Dubois. He said one time, he's supposed to have said, when I'm dead, bury me under the sidewalk so that people can walk over me in death the way they did in life. <laughs> Whether he ever said that or not, that's actually what happened. He was buried in the crypt under the old cathedral, but then a few years later, some wealthy layman died. They wanted the crypt for him. So they moved Dubois' body out, put it in some temporary vault under the front steps of the old cathedral, and then forgot about it. And his body was there for a hundred years. And literally, every day, people walked over it, going in and out of that church. Anyway, I wanted to get to John Hughes before my time runs out and somebody reaches for one of those bottles back there. But within the five years, Hughes became a nationally known figure, hated by many people, loved by some, but no one could ignore him. And I'd just like to point out there were three issues in the first five years that he was here that made him nationally famous. Later on, Bishop Ahern would talk about Cardinal Spellman. Spellman was famous before he ever came to New York. Hughes was not. And I'd say he was the first bishop or archbishop of New York to become nationally prominent. There were three issues that did it. First of all was the situation in his own cathedral, where the lay trustees had pretty much gotten control of the church. As you probably realize, back in those days, lay trustees were the legal owners of every church. They controlled the finances, and in many cases, they also tried to hire and fire the clergy. Poor old Bishop Dubois was at loggerheads with them for years. And on one occasion, Dubois hired a Sunday school teacher, a catechist. The lay trustees didn't like him. They called in the police to remove him from the classroom. At that point, John Hughes said to Dubois, this has gone far enough. He said, the same law that allows them to have the cops remove a catechist from the classroom would also allow them to remove a priest from the altar. You had better get back control of your own cathedral. Poor Dubois was incapable of doing it. So he asked Hughes to do it and used welcomed the opportunity. It gave him the opportunity for two things, a speech and a fight, and he loved both of those things. You know, what was said about Teddy Roosevelt, that he had to be the bride at every wedding, the corpse at every funeral. The same was true of Hughes. He had that same kind of domineering personality. I say the first issue that made him prominent was his clash with the trustees of the cathedral. What he did was actually very clever. Instead of confronting them head on, what he did is he appealed to the people who elected them. You know, that business of lay trusteeism is not as democratic as it might sound. The trustees were not elected by all the parishioners, but only by those who were wealthy enough to rent a pew every year. What Hughes did is he called a meeting in the old cathedral. It was February 24th, 1839. Some 600 people showed up. Not only the pew holders, but people from all over the, the city. It was the largest gathering of Catholics in the city to that date. And what Hughes did is he told them how the trustees had mistreated, in his opinion, the old bishop. And he said to them, do, do these people really represent you? Is this the way you want your representatives to treat this old bishop? He won them over. Not only that, but it was sheer demagoguery. Remember, just about everybody there would have been Irish. What Hughes did, he paired the trustees to the British government in Ireland. And he said, You're, they're treating Bishop Dubois the way the British government in Ireland treats the Catholic clergy there. He was so proud of what he did. The next day, he wrote a four-page letter to the Archbishop of Baltimore. And he bragged about how he laid it on so thick. He said to the people, you know, your sainted ancestors in heaven are looking down at you now. They're ashamed of you. For 300 years, they fought to protect the church in Ireland. And here now, in a country where religion is free, 
He said, you're letting pygmies among yourselves filch away the rights of the church that your ancestors would have died to defend. He says, and, and when he wrote that letter to the Archbishop of Baltimore, he said, by the time he finished speaking, many of the people were crying like children. And then he said, I wasn't far from tears myself. That's, that's after listening to his own rhetoric. The shot of it is the trustees resigned. He got control of the cathedral. And it was the beginning of the end of late trusteeism here in New York. That was the first issue. The second one was one that dragged on for 21 months. From July 1840 to August 1842. And it had to do with the state of the public schools in New York City. From 1824 or 25 on, the public schools in New York City were run by a private organization. It was called the Public School Society, but it really was a private organization, heavily Protestant in organization and sympathy. There were 103 schools in the city. Every year, the state legislature gave them a lump sum, and they used that money to run the public schools. And the atmosphere was very, very hostile to Catholics. There, were, there was mandatory reading from the King James Version of the Bible, Protestant hymns and prayers, and in the textbooks, often enough, the Catholic faith was ridiculed and mocked. In fact, many Catholic parents wouldn't send their kids to these schools. The governor of the state, William Seward, was very much alarmed at that because there were thousands of kids growing up in the city who had no education at all. There were very few Catholic schools. Parents wouldn't send their kids to these schools. So Seward, of all people, who was a Protestant, a Whig, he invited the Catholics to ask for their share of government money for their own schools. Hughes went to the Common Council, which was the city council of that day, and asked for a proportionate share of that money for Catholic schools. As you might imagine, he was turned down flat. He got nowhere, but he wasn't finished. Then he appealed to the state legislature. This went on for almost three years. And Hughes was particularly annoying at the Democratic Party in New York City. Back then, the two parties were the Whigs and the Democrats. Hughes expected opposition from the Whigs. After all, they represented the Protestant establishment. But he expected the Democrats to support his plea for a share of this tax money because they depended so much on the immigrant vote. He was furious when they wouldn't support him. What he did is something no other bishop has ever done and I hope no other bishop will do. He started his own political body. Now, it was just an ad hoc thing. And he only ran, I think, five candidates in constituencies where he knew there'd be a close vote between the Democrats and the Whigs. What he wanted to do is teach the Democrats a lesson, not to take the immigrant vote for granted. And several of them lost. That Catholic ticket, the Carroll Hall ticket, it only polled 2,200 votes, but it was enough in several key constituencies to cost the Democrats the election. That was the lesson Hughes wanted to teach them. Then, eventually, the state legislature responded by abolishing the public school society, and instead they instituted elected school boards. Now, it turned out in many ways to be a pyrrhic victory for Hughes, because what happened is the public schools rather quickly became completely secularized and all religion was driven out of the public schools. That isn't what he wanted, but he was determined to get rid of the public school society and he succeeded.